Hello, and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment, the podcast. I'm your host, Phil Friedrich, and today I am honored to have Jason Varney with me. And Jason's story is fascinating, and it's interesting. So he's the owner of Dock and Deck, and we're going to talk about how he's gotten to that point. So a question coming into today that you would ask yourself is, how does one become a TV star by building decks? <laughs> so Jason's story is going to highlight that. So Jason, thanks so much for being on today. Hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So to start your story as a, as a young individual, um, you know, kind of growing up or being raised in Tennessee, you'd spend a lot of time on the water. So talk a little bit about just, you know, childhood and enjoying time on the water. Um, yeah, I moved, moved to Knoxville, Tennessee at, at, when I was three years old. Yeah. Uh, we lived right here in the area I could currently still live in. And um, I, it's right on the Tennessee River. And that was what life's all about. You know, the lakes, the mountains, the outdoors, a lot of that kind of stuff. And um, I just grew up really enjoying it. That's where I found happiness, going to fish, ride around my little boat, you know, that kind of stuff as a young, young kid. When most kids are out, you know, hoping for this or that, I was hoping for a John boat. So I worked all summer and got me a John boat, explored the river. And what we call the river is the lake. Um, yeah. So, and, and one thing led to the next and I just found enjoyment there. So I just never knew that I'd make a living on it. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Now growing up, were there any jobs that you had as a, as a youngster, you know, maybe throughout grade school or into high school? Um, I did. Uh, started out, believe it or not, working at a nursery. Um, look, when I say a nursery, not a kid's nursery, but a nursery with plants. Yeah. Um, went from that and into lifeguard. Um, went from a lifeguard to, to start working at um, clothing stores like everybody. And then it kind of, you know, progressed where I went into college. And at that point, it changed. And I went into a completely different focus um, where I worked for Chevrolet Motor Division. I worked there for 11 years and then was able to just completely leave that career and go into another line of what I really wanted to do. And that's when I chose to go into building. I love that. So I, something I want to highlight and kind of talk through is, you know, you went to work for Chevy and uh, that was something that was probably a good career, right? You, you could have done that your whole life, but it wasn't something that you were overly passionate about. And I think for a lot of people, they find themselves in that spot, right? I'm doing something because it pays the bills, or I'm doing something because it's consistent. I'm doing something for whatever the reason is, but it's not really the thing that drives my passion. So talk about being able to make that pivot from maybe what was comfortable to really what was fulfilling. I was really not able to make that pivot on my own. Um, my father owned a um, company, a, a part owner in a big company that did really well and sold publicly. At that point, he took us all to um, the Dominican Republic and went on vacation. He came back and he said, I'd like for you to quit your job and go do something you enjoy. If you enjoy wow. doing it, you will find success at it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny, you know, and I'm not too afraid to talk about it, but I mean, at that time, I had slowly moved up the ladder. I started at 18,000, then it went from 18 to 36, 36, just kept moving up. After 10 years of being there, you know, you're making $50,000. You think I can provide and support for my family, but that's yeah. really what you're doing. You have a career that is just to support your family. Um, it's not what you're passionate about. It's not what you love. So he said, pick whatever it is that you want to do and go do it. But you have to do that. That's what you're going to have to do. Yeah. Um, so I did. I chose to um, go into either, you know, three different things. And I wanted to, one of them was be a professional fisherman in the ocean, which, I mean, that's no career. You know, you can't really do that. <laughs> um, I loved flying. And so I wanted to be a pilot. I thought that would be kind of cool. And then I really, really, when I ever had any free time, I was always building something, adding onto a deck in my yard or building a garden shed or building something for somebody. So that was really the path I took. And I decided to go into contracting and building. And, um, you know, it was just something I, I love. I still love it to this day. I, yeah. I can't get enough of it. I mean, I'm constantly working. I mean, even when you get to a point where, you're, you know, you consider yourself successful or financially able to not do what you're doing, yep. you find that you continue to branch off and do more and more because you just love what you're doing. So I, I love what I'm doing and I chose that career and it just, 
really surprised me because I didn't go into it. I went into it with the intent that it would be a way to make a living and provide for my family. I never thought it would turn into what it is today. Absolutely. So I want to highlight that conversation between, you know, your dad and, and the family, you know, when he said, Hey, I, I really want you guys to go pick something that you're passionate about. Was there any sense of, you know, he had done a job that he was passionate about and that's why he wanted you guys to do it. Or was it more, more so a sense of, I didn't necessarily do something I was passionate about, but I, you know, had the financial opportunity to now, you know, have those things. So I guess talk a little bit about that dynamic. He, he was he was very passionate about it. My dad, um, they they have a medical company that designed the the cyclotron that makes the radioactive isotope they inject in your blood for a brain scan. He was wow, uh, very very educated uh, to the point of almost <laughs> like you know you couldn't hold on a conversation with him because he was that smart. He was that guy. Um, my mom was a teacher and you know has has her masters in teaching and stuff. So she was very very bright and then you have this kid that comes out of school wants to play football wants to do this total down the different path of that um and they were very successful but they also did what they wanted to do yeah um and I think they knew that I wasn't doing exactly what I wanted to do and um if if you do what you want to do I know this now you are able to get good at it like I didn't I, I was always chasing the money Mm. I was working for somebody else. Yeah. I'm not chasing the money now. I'm chasing what I love and the money chases me. So <laughs> um, it's, it's kind of weird at how that works. So you don't ever hear that from people or they don't talk about it because they're like, oh, I don't want to talk about how much money I make or this, that. But I mean, just to rewind and go back, I mean, I started college and my wife now, girlfriend at the time, got pregnant. So at 18 years old, me and her had a child. Yeah. I ended up doing everything that you would not do in the right order and not anything that most people would consider the right way to do this. Um, I mean, literally I worked as I said, I worked at Chevrolet. I was working at Chevrolet during the day and as a janitor at night, I had two wow. jobs. I was doing whatever I could just to make enough money to pay the bills and put myself through college. And I noticed that I couldn't um, keep that up. I, I did. It was killing me. I was, I had to get up at six to go to Chevrolet. I left at five o'clock and went from, I had to be the, my other job at five 30 and I worked from five 30 until midnight. So I never saw my family. I never saw my wife. I never saw anybody. I had no free time and it was just work, work, work. Um, yeah. and then I was also trying to go to school at any given times that were available. So to make a long story short, um, I ended up dropping out of college. Um, and then everybody's like, okay, this kid, is an 18 year old with a child, not married, drops out of school. He's going to be a loser. I mean, that's the yeah. profile. Yeah, that is the, is the way it looks and what you probably are going to be stereotyped into what you find out is you have two options. You can either sink or swim. Yeah. You know, my dad had always said, like, if you really want to know, get hung out on the branch of a tree, you have two options. You're either going to fall down and hurt yourself or you're going to climb back to the main part of the tree and you're going to be able to climb. Yep. So it was kind of that mentality. I had to do something to provide and something to do good. And, um, you know, to this day, I, you know, I have two children. Yeah. Um, I, it's crazy to say, I mean, I'm 48 years old and I've got a kid that'll be 30 this year. And one, <laughs> 22. Um, but the 22 year old graduates from school, uh, from college in about, you know, four weeks. Yeah. Uh, my other son's already graduated from college. I didn't finish college, but I put both my kids through college and so cool. you know, they're able to come out, have everything. And they work for the business now and run it with me. So yeah, it's great. So, so let's talk about that for a minute. I mean, 18 years old working two jobs. I mean, that's probably tough and it's stressful. And I think that's oftentimes where, you know, grit and character shows, right? Because you could have said, ah, man, two jobs, that's a lot. Like, I'm not going to do it. Hey, can I get some help from somewhere? Or, well, I don't know what we're going to do. But talk just a little bit about, you know, inner Jason and why to you that was so important to go get not only one job, but two jobs to make sure that, hey, I can financially support and take care of, you know, the family unit. Well, I think 
it, it was done in a couple of parts and it, it, it's taught me a lot about parenting, a lot about that. My parents, obviously, I just told you, um, had a business and yeah. sold. And so financially they were set. They did not believe in my motivation and how I was doing where they could have helped me at any given time and, and should have mm -hmm. in my personal opinion. But at the same time, they didn't, they, yeah. they kind of wanted to watch me sink. So it kind of lit a fire under me and they said, you know, like, I'll show you what bad decisions are all about. And I said, I'll show you <laughs> what I can do. So yeah. I basically used it as motivation I and um, used that to just start pounding away and really going, going, going. And what that did was I never let up um, ever. And it's just like, I'm going to keep doing, I'm going to keep getting better. Yeah. And, you know, after working for Chevrolet there for, for 10 years, I think my parents saw that I really did work and were trying to, to get to where I needed to be or get ahead or whatever. And that's where um, it kind of turned over. And they said, so now do what you want yeah, and see what, how good you do. Um, and, and it was a big turning point for me. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and maybe even talk a little bit about once again, I don't know your, you know, your relationship with your parents, but you know, that's something to have a chip on your shoulder when, like you said, I thought maybe they would help me and they really didn't. Uh, but then to have that kind of vote of confidence, you know, a decade later, you know, 12 years later of, Hey, you know what, you you've really proven yourself. You've really grinded through this and done, you know, made something for yourself with Chevy, you know, almost getting that kind of validation from them later on in life. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I, I think you're right. They, they did have a, um, it was a chip on my shoulder mentality. I was aggravated with them. I, I really was frustrated with them to the point where, you know, you see somebody can do anything they want. They both retire at 50 years old. They travel all over, they do whatever. And I'm over here literally grinding with everything I've got to the point where I say it in, in people, when I talk to people now in groups and stuff, um, we were so bad off at some, at one point when we first had Taylor that we received government help, meaning I got food stamps and WIC. Yeah. That bad. And, and when you come from not ever being in that situation to realizing that you're at the, in your mind, you have reached the bottom of the barrel. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so I just never let it really get me down. I just kept doing whatever it took to make it, yeah. make it, make it. And then they saw that it was just really grinding and doing it. And that's when 10 years down the road, I guess my family, my mom and dad really saw that I was doing so much for it that um, that's when the relationship, I think, changed. They acknowledged that I was not, you know, probably going to be a loser. I would make it whatever it took. And both my other uh, siblings, I have a brother and a sister. Uh, my brother has two, two degrees from University of Tennessee. My sister um, graduated from University of Tennessee as well. Um, both of them, you know, went down the, the perfect little I'm a college grad path and, <laughs> you know, had the two kids afterwards, got the dog, the fenced in yard, the whole nine yards where this ball bounced way down the street, rolled in the gutter, you know. So, but the, the answer is, I don't think even to this day, like my son's, why don't you go back to school, Dad? Why do I? And it's not that I don't love school. I loved school and I loved everything about it. But what I've always wanted to tell everybody that I talk to or interact with is there's a path for everybody. You don't yeah. have to go down the exact path that everybody thinks that it is. Ask Steve Jobs if he went down that path. Ask right. all, the, all the huge guys out there. Did they graduate from college? Were they, did they... Look at Elon Musk. Look at, I mean, Jeff Bezos. I can list them off for hours of people. Now, we're also selecting the highest wealth individuals in the world, and they're very selected few people, too. Yeah. I love college. It's why I made my sons go. Yeah. And I believe that education definitely has a key. It's always a backup plan. But my backup plans, I'm going to bust it regardless. Yeah. Well, so well, if you, I... take, you take it all away from me today, I'm going to rebuild it again. 
That's yeah. my back. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think sometimes people just try and isolate that one piece, right? Well, they didn't go to school. Well, yeah, but they have a insane work ethic, right? Like, like you can't oh, yeah. not go to school and then also not have a work ethic. It's like, yeah, work ethic can make up for some of those things that maybe you didn't get in a textbook, right? You're exactly right. I think that that was the key. You have to, you have to have drive yourself. You have to put it in. And you see a lot of that today in today's day and age that I think like the kids, um, they see mom and dad driving the Range Rovers and they see the big houses and they see the lifestyles, they see the fancy vacations that didn't come all of a sudden. The, their, their parents are, you know, 40s, 50s, whatever the age may be. And they've lived this life that you see a guy today sitting in this house and living a lifestyle, but you don't understand what it took to get here. Yeah. And they just want it handed to them and they think that it's going to happen. They're just going to get it handed. Well, handed doesn't happen. I mean, even going to college, you have to get through college. That's why they make classes hard and stuff to prove that you can make it through it. You also have to have, once you come out of college, you can have a 4-0 and be really smart. But if you don't have any drive to go out and get a job, you're going to have a pretty diploma on the wall that you spent $200,000 <laughs> on that... I mean, it's, it's not going to ever pay off. Yep. You have to cash that in. And that's, that's what I've always told everybody else. It's, it's, it's like having a winning lottery ticket. You've got to go cash it in. You have to say, I'm going to take my ticket and get my money. So yes. you, can, you can go to any convenience store and buy that lottery ticket and it show as a winner. And that's what you get. You get a show on the wall. I'm a winner as yep. going to college. But until you take that ticket and cash it in and let it start paying you off, you're, you didn't take advantage of it. So that's awesome. It, I love yeah. it. I love it. So to fast forward, Jason, to your story then. So we're, we're done with Chevy. We've kind of figured out, Hey, there's three different things I'd like to do. I either like to fish fly or build things. You decide, you know, maybe building some log type homes would be a uh, interesting type of a career. So talk a little bit about getting started in that uh, industry. <laughs> yeah, when I started, I started, believe it or not, in log home and timber frames. Yeah. Um, I had a friend that um, they owned a log home business in Knoxville here. And it was like, I can go to work for them and start learning the construction trade and learning how to build and do this and that. And I started um, selling log home packages and building the log home packages up to what's called dry in or a roof okay. up into paper. And then we turned them over general contractors in the area and let them finish them. Um, did that, found great success. Um, you know, like I said, when I quit Chevrolet, I made $50,000 a year. The first year I was doing that, I mean, I made over a hundred. I mean, wow. it was in the first true year of doing it. The next year I made more than that. And it, so my salary had more than doubled and I'm doing what I love. Hmm. Um, with that, some people in the industry saw what I was doing and said, Hey, would you represent our company from Canada? And, um, handle all the U S sales and U S building and stuff. And I've said, absolutely. I took it on. And unfortunately, right about that time, I'm killing it. Just absolutely killing it. And we all know what happened in 2007, 2008. <laughs> yeah. The worst time ever in building industry and in economic times that we've seen yeah. since the depression. So um, that's what happened. It hit like a load of bricks and, um, I didn't have, everybody goes like, what was 2008 like? Did it, were you up here? And then it dropped off. And I was like, no, it went into a negative inverted dive. <laughs> I mean, people were canceling contracts or right. asking for deposits. They were doing everything. It was not a slow drop. This was a absolute roller coaster ride. It went in a negative backwards dive. Yeah. And um, I, I don't know how it happened. I, I I look kind of up and say, maybe it was somebody above me looking down on me and helping me out. Um, yeah. I um, had a customer, we were doing our last, one of our last jobs that I really had on books. And um, he asked me, would you build a boat dock for me? <laughs> uh, I don't build boat docks, stupid boat docks. I build million dollar houses, you know? Yeah. And luxury houses for secondary, you know, high income people that could do whatever they want. And I thought about it for a second. And then I said, what do I have on the books? Yeah. You don't have anything, Jason. So I said, I'm going to build a boat dock. And that boat dock happened. And 
that boat dock turned into three boat docks and three boat docks turned into six and that turned into me buying barges and me buying this and that and never looked back. It just kept going and going and going. The whole time on the first year, I'm still trying to sell log home and timber frames while people are driving up while we're doing boat dock work saying, you guys build these? And they're asking if we could build them. And what we found out was during the times of recession and times of bad times, um, people who have, and I hate to stereotype that, but people who have money, um, especially the pe- the clientele we use, waterfront living. Waterfront living is pretty much the highest rent district that you can get. Yeah. Um, they're pretty well healed, most of them. And what you find out is they're able to continue doing what they want. Um, yep. Even when the rest are suffering, they might not be buying another house at the beach, but what they are doing is putting a dock at their current residence or yeah. updating or doing something like that. And also people who have money also understand money. And when times are rough, that's the time to spend and get it done because it's the cheapest. Yep. It's the cheapest time for them to do it. So that's they right. at the downturn and profit on the upturn. So um, yep. while everybody else's stuff was going in the tank, our business started and it looked like the opposite of that negative dive. It was just straight up where this was just straight down. And yeah. Huge success right from the start. And, um, and well, but I say huge success again, I went from making more money than I'd ever made in my life to 2007, $14,000. So yeah. I got to reality check real quick on how I can throw cut you back. <laughs> That's right. Well, so there's two things I want to highlight in that story. One is you said, I don't build docks, but I'll figure it out. Right. You said yes to the job. And so talk a little bit about that, you know, saying yes to something, even though maybe you didn't feel the most confident that you knew how to do it, but it's like, well, I'll figure it out. So just talk a little bit about saying yes, even though maybe you're not prepared yet. Yeah. And I think that's back to what we were just now talking about. You have to have the drive. You have to have the ability to make the money. You have to have the, the want. Yeah. The want is this. I told you earlier, take it all away. I'll make it again. Yeah. I will find a way. If I have to dig sewer ditches, I'm going to make my money. Yeah. I will find a way to be profitable and make, make money in life and provide. Um, I think that's where a lot of times people don't have it. A lot of the younger kids think it just comes to them back to when we didn't have anything and I didn't have the ability. If my dishwasher broke, I couldn't go down to the Lowe's or Home Depot and buy a new dishwasher and have them come out and install it. I had to buy a secondhand dishwasher and I had to install it myself. Yeah. So how do you do it? You figure it out. You take the panels off, you unplug the wiring, you hope you turn the breaker off so you don't (laughs) want a bad lesson. You you do what you got to do. You tighten up all the hoses so it doesn't leak. Yep. And you pray it comes on. Yeah. And you realize that you can do it. So there's nothing. I looked at that exactly the same way. I said, here's the thing. I've never built a boat dock, but I was building timber frame homes. Yeah. A timber frame home, you start with your post and then you put your headers on it. Then you put your roof on it and everything else. Well, when you build a deck or a dock, what are you doing? You're putting your post in the ground. You're putting your headers on it. You're putting your roof on it. You're building your floor system. It's the same thing. It just happens to be over water. Water's a little bit more difficult. It's not a little more difficult. It's a lot lot more. (laughs) Everything compounds tenfold probably. But at the same time, it's just doing something that somebody else has already done. We didn't reinvent the wheel. We're just just doing it another way. So um, I thought, why not give it a try? What else do I have to lose, man? I'm I'm going in the tubes if I don't. So yeah. I'm going to try this. I made that first one at a profit that I thought the man would never take. It's crazy to talk about it now because that first job was right at $69,000. I remember it. Um, and I was used to handing over a contract to build a house for a million plus. Yeah. Yeah. And I was shaking like no other thing when I handed this guy this proposal on my own. And um, he uh, looked at it and said, is this the price? Yep. He just reaches over, grabs a pen, signs a contract. I'm ready to get started. And that was the highest grossing thing I've ever done, right? Yeah. Never had, yeah. You look at margins on a home 
15% was a big margin. This was like a 25% margin. So I was like thinking he's going to get mad and upset. Well, he signed it and everything went perfect. And from that point on, we were just like, like rolling. So I love it. Um, it went, it went great, but I think having the, having no fear to get where you're going to get is one of the keys. Yeah. Uh, I, I listen to motivational stuff every morning and yeah. I'm a huge TikToker now. Cause I love the <laughs> videos and it doesn't show me like, Hey, my kid's starting kindergarten. It just has good instructional videos and yeah. stuff to watch. And, um, you know, politics aren't in it and all that. So it's a good source to just watch things happen. And, um, a lot of it's motivation stuff too, that I've fallen in, you know, it's, there's a lot of times these motivational speakers and stuff will tell you, you have to, there's one thing that's guaranteed. You're not going to be successful if you don't try it. Mm, yeah. But you're not going to be successful if you don't try it. And the next thing is jump. You've got yeah. to jump. You have to take that leap. If you don't, you will always stay where you're at. So we don't know if we're going to slam in the ground when we jump. But we don't just jump if we know there's not a chance of, of making it. Yeah. But take educated decisions, think about it, plan a course of path, and then jump. It, it, yeah. It's all that we can do is learn. And a lot of times, like I tell my sons, everything else, I've made every mistake there is. I continue to make them. I don't make them twice. Yeah. P, don't make them twice. Just no. keep doing, learning from your mistakes and but if, if my guys don't, everybody goes, are you going to get mad at him for that? Are you going to get upset? No, I'm not going to get upset. He has to make the decision and he'll learn from the mistake. And so will I, yep. but we don't learn anything if we don't try. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and the second thing that I'd like to highlight and kind of talks about making the jump is, you know, it sounds like you really took your ego out of it, right? Because I mean, I was doing million dollar home proposals and now I'm doing this $69,000 proposal. I mean, there's so many examples of businesses in the history of business, right? That say, no, this is what we do. And they never pivot. And then they end up getting surpassed, right? I mean, a, a blockbuster. Hey, no, this is how we do business. Well, there's this thing called Netflix and it just jumped you and you're no longer a behemoth because you never pivoted. So maybe talk a little bit about being willing to take ego out of it and say, you know what? This is just not the opportunity right now. I need to pivot and transition into something that is viable for us. Yeah, I think I think that lesson was taught to me during the path. Yeah. And that during the path, taking your ego out of it. Yeah. Um, the economy took my ego out of things. <laughs> they taught me that stand up, think that you're rich, think that you're awesome, think that you're great. And boom, it will put you in your place real quick. So my ego, I mean, you have to be proud of your accomplishments and you have to um have strong self-esteem and you know. I'm the best builder. I'm the best this. You have to carry that mentality. You also have to be, in my opinion, open to the idea that there's better. There's not a person out there that I can't talk to and learn from. Yes. And, and everybody's a teacher. It depends on what the, what the lesson is that they're teaching. So you, you have to just go into it and say, hey, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what I can get out of this. Yeah. Put my ego aside and you know, just, just listen to how he's running his business. Maybe I've got 95% figured out, but that 5% that he may be doing better than me and I can put it into my system and do it better and get up to the 98%. But even when you get to the 98%, you listen to another guy that's probably at your level or better. And he has found out that he was at 98% and he did some modifying and some changes that even brought his business up to the next level. Yep. And that's what I always try to get at when I talk to any super, super um, successful person. Absolutely. In is what do you, what was your key to success? How did you get there? Why did you get there? What was the steps that you got there? And, um, you know, if you have an ego involved, you won't be ever able to pass that up. It's to me, that's probably the smallest thing on my plate is it, that it's my company's name or this or that. Yep. And you were right when you said that about Netflix in comparison to Blockbuster. I say it all the time with products that we use and the new companies coming alive and stuff. And that is if everybody looks 
at the way certain companies that have been super successful did, they did pivot, they did continue to make modifications. And I always use it like with Apple. Mm. Apple came out with an iPhone three, the three went to a four and a four went to a five and a five went to a six. Man, that iPhone six was awesome. What if iPhone six just stopped at iPhone six? Right. Do you think they'd have a 13 pro today? <laughs> right. They didn't run circles around the six, right? And, and if they didn't, their competition, the Samsungs, the Motorola's, everything else would have continued to make product. And guess what? They would have far surpassed them. And once they get that far out in front, it's hard to come back. Yeah. So I think it is morphing with the times, doing, making changes, listening to your people and drop the ego, move on, man. Because we are all about still to this day, people now say, man, you guys do the best this and you're, you're award winner and you, you've done this, you've done that. No, what I've done is I've put the best people in the best positions and let them run. Yeah. And watch them I can help direct when I need to help make decisions so they don't make a wrong decision. But at the same time, I wouldn't have hired them if they weren't the people that I feel that were the best suited to do it. And what you find out is, is take the ego out, sit back and you watch your numbers, your company go higher. The awards win more, all the stuff happened because you've expanded and put a much better dynamic portfolio behind you which really elevates you in the end. So. That's really good. So as the business is growing, like you said, it went from one doc to three docs to six docs, and it just keeps growing. There are pains with growing a business. <laughs> you know, when there's only a handful of people to keep track of or two jobs to keep track of, it's really easy. And then all of a sudden it becomes 10, it becomes 20. So talk a little bit about scaling your business and, you know, some of the lessons learned there. Um, scaling is, is something that I try to teach now to other contractors and, and yeah. stuff because we went from the nothing to the top yeah. and we've learned, unfortunately, many expensive lessons during the time. Um, you're right. You go from having nothing to you're constantly working. You're that man. You're just busting it, busting it, busting it, trying to do it all yourself. And then you have to hire somebody. Yeah. Like, how am I going to pay this guy's wage? And what you find out, it's kind of like a man and a woman starting a family out. We want to have children. Then all of a sudden she's pregnant. How are we going to have a kid? You know, how are we going to afford it? But what yeah. you find out is you can afford it. Yep. And then a year and a half down the road, we're like, we need to go ahead and have another one. We didn't even know how we we're going to afford the first one. But then we we're talking about having another one. Yeah. And you have a child and guess what? You can afford it. And then you, have, we don't have enough room in our house. We afforded to get a bigger home or found a way to do it. Yep. It's finding the ways by doing it through the process. Um, but then again, there are scaling issues. There's people who go out and scale too fast. We yeah. scale too fast. We went, um, we literally started, I told you our first year in business, we did $69,000. We over doubled that number the next year and went to 190, went from 190 to $390. I mean, 390,000. Yeah. We went from that number to over eight, over eight, up into the million dollar categories. And then it started doing that climb. It, so it doubled every year for four or five years. Yeah. And started the curve. Yep. And it's cruising along. And then there's some other act, other stuff that happened, television, that type of stuff that happened. And it went skyrocket again. The year that that initially happened, we doubled our income at that level. Doubled our sales. Yeah. Our income. Let me make sure you get that correct. Yeah. Not our income, our sales. We doubled our sales. Because yep. that's key in this conversation. That is, we doubled our sales, but at the end of the year, I didn't make as much money. Yeah. And then realize, uh oh, what happened? What's right. going on? Why is this this way? And so, what you, we had to do is, again, put our ego aside. I called my CPAs and um, told them, hey, man, I need to know what's going on. And we went in and had a professional audit done on me and the business. And I paid to have that done to find yeah. out what I'm messing up on. And they just flat out told me, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. And at that point, I looked at it and just because you're bigger, you have more trucks, you have more people, doesn't mean you're more profitable. It means that you're just scaling. And sometimes scaling doesn't work good. 
Yeah. It doesn't. There's things in business that people just don't get. And until you understand or, or watch somebody that's gone through it, tell you about it. And just because you have everybody in these industry groups and stuff, oh, I build 600 decks. I build 900. I build 1,000. I've got 15 crews. I've got 20 crews. And then there's this guy over in the corner that says, I built eight projects with one crew and we do the same amount of money or I make more money than you. Right. I want to be that guy. Yeah. Well, it's the, ego, it's the ego, right? It's the ego because that it's guy can't necessarily say I've got 15, 20 crews or I've got 100 trucks, but he can say I made more money and I worked less. So, and, and, what he, and, and it's not all about the money, but yeah. you find out that that guy is working a lot less. He's a lot happier. He gets to go home and spend time with his family, his kids, his wife, whatever. Yeah. He gets to travel. He gets to have a life outside of work. Yeah. And that, you know, it, it, that ego thing, somebody, they asked me and did an interview on it not too long ago. And they asked me, uh, when did you find success or when do you think you were, were successful? I, I think success, a lot of people in business consider success a dollar number. Yeah. Success isn't a dollar number. Success is happiness. And people find happiness. You've been around it. You've interviewed people. You know what I'm talking about. You've interviewed guys that are making tens of hundreds of millions of dollars and want to drive themselves into a bridge in bank <laughs> down the road. Right. They're not as happy as the guy that's down fishing in the yep. coast and catching fish every day and selling it to the farmer's market or whatever. Yep. He has found that that's where his happiness is. He's doing what he enjoys, making the numbers he needs to make and, and do it. And I think at the end of the day, that's what it's all about is success is knowing that you get to do what you want to do you're happy at doing it and that it's providing and anything above and beyond that is purely a gift from God, in my opinion, that that's happening and happening for the right reasons. And, you know, a lot of that comes from doing right and making sure that you're doing, um, watching your numbers, watching your stuff and running a very clean business. And you don't have to have the most, the biggest, whatever. You can just be the most effective. So yes. that's, where I, that's where I wanted to be. And that's what makes me happy. Absolutely. So. Well, and I agree with you on that. And, you know, the term that I always try and help people see is don't use the term successful because usually success is some, like you said, some dollar amount you're chasing or some comparison to somebody. And I use Correct. the term, what, what will it take for you to be fulfilled, right? Uh, fulfillment can be found, just like you said, fishing, right? Well, by the world standards, you might not call that successful, right? Because they're making X amount or they're a fisherman, uh, you know, at a farmer's market, just selling it. But if they feel fulfilled, that's, that should be their definition of success. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I love it. So Jason, with your story, then, uh, like you mentioned, you're growing your business and things are going really well. And then you get this phone call that you think is going to be a, or you think it's a prank phone call, actually. Yeah, it, it, it actually, that's the way it worked out for me. Um, one day I'm clipping along and I get a phone call and a person says, you know, hey, <coughs> we want to do a TV show on you. I was like, hey, whoever sets you up to this, <laughs> you can tell me it didn't work. Um, you, you didn't catch me. I, I didn't fall for it. Yeah. Uh, you know. They've made shows for years, punked and all that stuff. I thought yeah. that's what was going on. I was like, I'm not going to fall for this. People like, we're not joking that we're being serious. And I was like, okay, well, if you're serious, I've got Skype, I've got FaceTime, Zoom, whatever you want to do. Call me up. Let's have a meeting. And um, they said, when would that be? And I said, tomorrow. Let's do it at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. I come back, I <laughs> sit in my office and, and um, say it. Let's set this up. I have my sons there and turn the camera on and he rings and host picking up and boom. I look out and all of a sudden, what do I see? I see a skyline, of New York City, with a whole bunch of people around a table that I had no idea who they were. And I was like, well, if somebody's pranking me, they're spending some money to prank me, you know? <laughs> it was it was kind of weird because they said, Oh, we want to talk to you about that doing a show and you're kind of always at that point, you think that's the phone call that you always want to hear, right? Oh, this is awesome. I want, I want that. I want this. And it didn't, um, it didn't happen to me that way. I mean, I just, I, I listened to what they had to say. They kind of, um, 
told me how they would like to structure a show, what it would like to be and add drama in and this and that. And quite frankly, I'm running a very successful business and I really don't want to mess up anything. So it just didn't seem right to me. Um, So I just said, you know, Hey, guess what? Call me back in a little while or whatever. So I just started avoiding the call. And um, I I just kind of, I just punted. I just decided this isn't for me. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. It went from that to um, an, another person tried calling us, not interested. And then they kept on, the network kept on and um, I guess located somebody in our town, a media company in our town and uh, in Knoxville that we're pretty big um, media town because of people are headquartered here, yeah. um, which Discovery is headquartered in Knoxville and everything else. And they said um, to the person that answered the phone, hey, we're trying to get a show with this with just gentleman and they told him he said what's his name they said my name and he said i know him i went to high school with that guy yeah hey, i got a cell phone number let me call him and talk to him so he called and told me about it and i was like man listen i've already heard this i just don't think i'm interested and he was like let me take you lunch. let me just talk to you so um took me to lunch we talked about it he said listen i'm not even gonna be in your way we'll just have cameras there have drones do whatever let us film for a few days, get some information, and then let me show you what we got. He uh, did that. I really didn't notice anything that was different about it. And um, went about my business. A few weeks later, they called me, like, hey, we want you to see something. And I went out there, and it was like sit in front of a room and turn this big 80-something inch TV on. And here's a sizzle reel of it. And the sizzle was just like, wow, this is amazing. This is what I build. Like, yeah. I didn't realize. I guess what it does is it caught me kind of by surprise because you don't, if you can picture, like if you had somebody at your house every day videoing while you raise children from yeah, the right. birth that they left and then watch what your children turned out to be, but also got to see, also you were able to watch where your children interact with their friends and how they played sports and the decisions they made behind the scenes that you never knew about. But yet it all came together at the end and turned out to be this great thing. That's the kind of feeling it made for me. And um, I was like, wow, this is awesome. And um, so make a long story short, did did the sizzle. They sent it through. Um, They liked it. They ordered a pilot. The pilot show went off and did extremely, extremely well. Um, And at that point, you know, they came back in a month or two or so and then came back and said, uh, we're going full on for a, you know, syndicated show on television, this full series. And uh, we started the filming and the rest is history. So I love it. So something that sticks out to me within that is how frequently do we think just because we can, we should, right? Just because I can do something doesn't always mean you should do it. And so when you first got that phone call, you're like, yeah, that would be really cool, right? I mean, to your point, it's everyone's dream, right? Is to have a TV show or be on it. But I already have a successful business. Like I don't necessarily need this to get to a successful level or to a business that I'm proud of. So talk about just, you know, once again, even though you could do something, not saying I have to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think that you have to make the best decisions for your business, your family, everything when you go out and get opportunities. And it's not TV shows as an opportunity. It's the opportunity to buy a new building, to expand yeah. to another area, to do any of that. Um, by hiring, it, it, it's just like if you have a real successful business and you say, I'm going to go out and let's build a new building and make a bigger business. It's going to take time. It's going to take something away from what you already did to do it. It yep. takes effort to do anything that yes. you're going to do and be successful at. So is the effort worth the reward? At yeah. The end of the day, you have to always look at that. And some people find the reward of being on television and being noticed when you travel and when you go places, the popularity, the the Instagram followers, the blue check mark that you get, the all the, the what the kids would call cool or you know, nowadays. Yeah. That that's that's neat. I'm not gonna say a thing about it. it it's something that it, it is flattering. It's flattering for people to know who you are when you don't even know them. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, it comes with, it's, it's definitely got its challenges and yeah. um, it's not for the faint of heart, nor would I 
you know, everybody in the industry doesn't do it forever. Look, I mean, let's, yep. let's take, take any of the big of this to the best. I mean, then we can rewind it really quick to duck dynasty, right? Duck dynasty. A few years ago, you couldn't go to a Walmart without seeing everything that had duck dynasty on it. Everything was camo. Everything talked. Yeah. About it. You talked about, have you heard about that word this year? No. Was like, have you heard about it since COVID? No. no. It, it kind of went away. Yeah. But guess what those guys have? They still run a multi-million dollar business yep. and they couldn't let a TV show get in the way of their primary focus, what they, yeah. what they actually got to that point because of. Yeah. Somebody noticed what they were doing and that's why they got what they got. So um, yeah. you have to you have to just look at it like that. No, that's really good. So, Jason, you mentioned you've got a 30 year old son or about to be 30 and a 22 year old son that get to work in the business with you. Talk a little bit about what that means, you know, just knowing once again, rewinding in your story, kind of that dynamic with your parents and then now having an opportunity to bring, you know, your sons into a business and give them, you know, an opportunity to work for a great company. So just talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, being able to talk about that and do it is a, is a great thing because I get to spend time with them. Yeah. Um, I talked about the successes of my parents and everything else, but I didn't yeah. tell you was, um, my dad died suddenly 11 years ago um, and he died of a heart attack at the age of 63. And um, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with him. I was, he was very involved in his business and I didn't get a lot of time with him. Yeah. That was one of the decisions on why we got to, why I decided to do the television show is because, you know, when we did, even when I had to do his funeral, I had to get pictures together of my dad. And what I noticed was I went and saw my father, my mom, and my dad all the time. Right. And, time, and this is to anybody I can talk to, I always tell them this because it means so much and you will appreciate it. And if I just change one person now, you will greatly appreciate this comment if you take nothing more away from this interview than what I'm telling anybody. And that is, you went, when was the last time you saw your parents? You. I'm, I'm asking you a question. When was last, last time? I was February, take two a months ago. Take did a not, picture. did not. Yeah. So here's the thing: when you had Christmas in December with them, did you take a picture with your mom and dad? No. Nope. Did you did you take a picture of you know what you got them and smiling or anything like that? No, you never really. You you get to make that memory, but you never took that picture or you never documented that time. And yeah. so. If you had to say, when was the last time you had a good picture with your mom or your dad or any loved one or anybody, take a little more time. Yeah. Say thank you. Give them a hug. Give them a kiss. Take the picture. That's what it was about to me, right? Well, I missed all that um, when I lost my dad and didn't have all these things. And I look back on, I don't have any videos. I had yeah. an iPhone. I never videoed it. I, you know, I had um, a voice memo that I've saved. Yeah. It's the only time I've ever can still hear his voice. It's, and the reason why I say all this is because that's when they decided to do a show, it'll always go down. Like, so if something's to happen to me today, yep. my kids can show their kids that aren't even born yet. This is your yep. grandpa. This is what we built together. And this is what we did. And, you know, definitely they take a thousand pictures an episode when they do that. <laughs> you know, pictures at my funeral. Right. So, yeah. um, so needless to say, I think it's, um, was what I really love about it. Most, it's kind of weird how it works. My wife, um, raised majority of the kids, the, yeah. the kids, right. And most women are the, the nurturers and the ones who raise them while we're out working and, and, um, trying to provide. And then, so when the kids got old enough that they went to college and they went on, now they, she felt like she lost them. I feel mm -hmm. like I gained them They're around me every day. Yeah. So we get to spend a lot more time and we get to work together and build things together. And it'll always be documented that that's what we did together. So I personally cannot say enough about having uh, family businesses definitely have their challenges. <laughs> yeah. let's, not, let's not joke about that. But at the same time, there's also some huge benefits by working together and having it made. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jason, I want to say thank you for sharing your story. Are there any other pivotal moments that you would like to highlight just as you kind of think about, you know, where you started and where you've been today? Uh, Really? No. I mean, it's just, I think that, you know, there's not enough credit goes to in business. A lot of people don't ever credit the stuff of where the pivotal moments were, but a lot of times the pivotal moments, and I said it just now about like my wife, yeah, you know, that she was raising the kids and um, I didn't, you never think about it like that, but she had a job also. Absolutely. And a lot of times when you start out in business or when you're going through business, knowing that she's being able to help provide as well. And I know we talk about money and it gets always caught up and, oh, I make this X, uh, she makes only this much, whatever. Sometimes it was that money that she was bringing to the table that afforded me the ability to take that risk. Yep. I knew that because she was working and she had a job, I could go out and buy that piece of equipment that I probably couldn't have bought on my own because it would have taken away from the family. And those pivotal moments made huge successes for yep. us as, and you know, it's, uh, everybody goes, and I always say it's my business, my house, my this, but those are things that you guys do together and it makes a huge difference. So don't yeah. ever let the small things go under uh, the table or under the rug, we should say, because those are huge steps and were huge milestones and pivotal moments Absolutely. that we saw huge success. So. Yeah, I never forget your spouse is your uh, first business partner, right? <laughs> oh yeah, and, and I can assure you, when that business splits, they're going to get their part, right? So that's right. Um, you need to make sure you remember that. Um, that's exactly right. They're your business partner, and that if you think they're not, wait until you go through a divorce hearing or something with somebody, and you'll find out that they <laughs> they do own half, regardless. So that's right. Uh, well, Jason, thanks again so much for being on and just sharing all the great, you know, moments that have led to where you're at. And uh, I'm excited to just continue to follow your journey. And uh, I mean, we're gonna have to do this again here in a couple of years when, you know, TV show number two or next business, or if you start your uh, fishing business, we'll have to highlight you as a fisherman. Yeah, yeah that's right. Well, uh, thanks for thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for continuing to follow me. And um, like I said, hopefully you'll see some new stuff. Maybe there's some stuff right now in the works that we're talking about with some TV. So maybe there'll be something different um, to get to watch a little bit of. So I love it. Enjoy and thanks for having me.